everybody. I hope you can hear me well. Uh, so let's talk about factory buy today. Um, first things first, uh, these slides deck are already in the speakerdeck.com slash cmyscd. So if you can't see any code or anything, you can follow the presentation uh, online. So um, yeah, let's go. So first of all, who am I? Um, as uh, as I said already, so I'm a back-end developer. I work for SoundCloud. Um, I'm a Brazilian. Any Brazilians here? Wow, Jesus Christ. I thought we had more, right? Okay, sorry. Uh, I live in Berlin. Anyone living in Berlin here? <laughs> Thank you. So I just relocated to Berlin uh, like uh, six months or so. So if you want to chat, change any experience like Python stuff, please uh, send a message. I'm queer, any queer here? Ooh, just, just, yeah. From Berlin, maybe, no, okay. Uh, <laughs> uh, I don't live with my wife and a dog, anyone with a wife and, no, no, no okay, stop, stop, <laughs> just, okay. Uh, so I'm coding since 2010, long time, uh, mostly with Python and Ruby. Um, I love to work with communities, so conference, open source and stuff. Uh, I helped to organize a lot of different conferences, Python Brazil, I helped on Euro Python 2020, yes. And I hope to, I also helped to create uh, pyjamas and help organizing. Um, I love to work with open source, as I already said. Uh, one of the main projects that I work at, that I work is uh, Scan API, that, uh, this project I created and I helped to maintain. Uh, basically, it's like a framework to create uh, automated documentation for REST APIs and also integrate, uh, to create integration tests. So if you are interested to, uh, about this, uh, this, this library, uh, we are going to have like a workshop tomorrow uh, here in DjangoCon, so just join me. Also, yeah, I changed the order of the slides, but anyways, like, have more than 1.5K downloads per month, so it's like super nice and super proud, and it's like really can't feel this number, so, and more like a lot of stars, and okay, whatever. So anyway, this is me, hello. <laughs> so let's start with Factory Boy, what is it? Uh, I'm super glad that we have already a lot of talks about testing before, so I think you are probably already in the vibe of testing and TDD, and, so yeah, but let's talk specifically about Factory Boy. Uh, it's a fixture replacement, so it's a library, and um, it's basically the idea is to stop using fixtures and starting using factories um, with it. So uh, it's based on Factory Bot, that is a gem for Ruby, and uh, basically it's like the Python version for it. Uh, it it's uh, the Factory Bot is uh, from uh, Thoughtbot, so quite nice company also. And the, the version, the first version for Factory Boy, they were only, uh, they, it was only for Django. It was only working for Django, but now, nowadays it's, nowadays it's framework independent, so it works with a lot of different frameworks. And also like work with unit tests, PyTest, and so on. Um, the idea here is that we are talking about, specifically in this, uh, this talk, uh, when we are uh, dealing with complex objects. So, when you have objects, models that have a lot of relationships and they are like complex and depending on a lot of each other. So in this case, especially in this case, like fixtures can be like a really not that good solution because they are static, they are hard to maintain. And on the other hand, like factories, they are easy to use, they are easy to customize and you can pass only the fields and you can already create your object. So just a small example of how we can do this, this is like from the Factory bot um, documentation basically is like a one, let's say here that we have an orders object and this orders object is super complex. Uh, so it depends on address and depends on customer and depends a lot of other stuff. And uh, with Factory Boy, you can create it only like in, in instantiating an object, uh, like a factory, uh, a factory for that. And uh, without, you have to like to create the address, create the customer, and do all this setup every time for every test that you want. So it's like pretty handful. Um, and also, one thing that I like uh, from Factory Boy is that we there is a lot of different tools that comes with it. So we can have sequence, for example, let's say that you have want to create 
uh, many many users, and then but the email field is required for the user, so you cannot create all the emails with the same uh, with with the same string. So you, let's say that once you create like user one, user two, user three dynamically, so you can use sequence. You can use Faker, which is quite um, quite powerful. That is basically to create uh, random random information, so let's say that you want to create an address, like a US address, so you can create, uh, use Faker for it, and it will generate like a random Faker, a uh, random data for you, or like create a Faker sentence, a Faker name, and then you can like have proper values, uh, but also random, uh, and many others that I'm just listing here, so you can check later, but still like you have a lot of uh, different tools for it. So my experience in working with Factory Boy was like mainly like working three years, like in the previous job I was working for, working with a really huge uh, monolith in, were written in Django, and that and that we were using Factory Boy, and uh, basically it was pretty huge because like it was more than 230 models, tables, uh, more than 2,200 relevant files, and more than 75k relevant lines. So it was like a monster, really. And uh, it was like pretty, pretty hard to deal with it because uh, if you change something, it breaks everything. So you really need to know where to touch there. So a monster. And uh, and then like starting working with it, I, I started like figure out some some things that were happening. Like first thing was that if you design a factory that's not well defined, or, like it's not following some principles. Um, it starts affecting many, many tests because everything starts depending on it and then you, you start having a chain of problems. Also, you might generate implicit errors because if, if someone understands the model in a one way and then you create a factor that doesn't match with the model, probably the person that will use it, it's, even if it's you in the future, you would assume that it works like the model, but if not, then probably you're going to create like different errors that you wouldn't expect. Also, uh, we started like to notice that um, a lot of times we were like creating the tests to fit the factory, so the factory was like not well designed, and then we were trying like to do all the all, all the, the fixes to make the the test pass based on the in the factory, not the way not the way around. That usually we you would like write a test and just use the factory as a helper, so you can use and have all the functionalities. Uh, so this is what, uh, what I call as factory-oriented tests. So we start like doing the testing just to pass, like just to, f to match the factory. So not, not, a, not a good approach. Um, also, the factories can get too tight. So you, when you have one factory and this factory depends on another in a not really good way, then you cannot start changing one because then it affects the other and the other, and then you just can't really change anything because otherwise you start breaking everything else. Um, and another thing is that when you start like to working with a not so good factory and you see a problem, you try to fix it, you do a hack, because if you change it, it will break everything, so you do a hack to make it pass, but then you are going to work again in another test that uses the same factory, and then you have to do the same hack, and then in that scenario, we were doing the same hack many times, really, copy and paste everywhere, and we are just already like, copying all the, the, the blocks already because we are super used to copy and paste the same hack over and over again. Uh, so, and then I started like to notice, okay, we have some patterns here. We are, have, we are, having, we are facing some problems and uh, let's, let's try to understand what are the root cause and how we, how we can fix them. So, uh, while we were analyzing this part, uh, like I started saying, uh, maybe we should start taking notice of this and uh, take notes of this and start like really writing some best practices so we can follow them then in the future. Um, so before starting talking about uh, the best practice itself, I'm going to introduce the demo app. This, this app is just like to, uh, as, to use as an example uh, because of course, as I said in the beginning, uh, this makes sense for complex objects, but if I show here a complex app, nobody would understand anything because we would take like five minutes only to understand the relationships. So I'm going to show like a really simple example just to illustrate the idea of having like complex objects and factories. Nice, so this is the application, basically um, a Django app application, uh, Django application, super basic. 
uh, this is the post uh, page and uh, where we have a list of polls and basically like you can vote on a poll so let's say that we want to vote if we prefer like coke or pepsi whatever so if we vote here then we go to the to this page to vote and then we can click on vote and if we click on vote we see the results and that's it basically and just taking a look in the in the the first screen uh, there are some some details here that we we should notice. The first one is this label that is new, that basically says that every time that a poll is, was created like in the last 24 hours, then we have this label new. Uh, another thing is that if the poll is premium, then it has like a star, so just to differentiate it. Also, uh, a poll can have or not an outer. So for example, in this first two, we have an outer, um, but in the, the last two, we don't. And also we can have polls in two different languages. One uh, is English or Portuguese. And if it's uh, English, we are going to use the preposition uh, for the author as by. But if it's uh, Portuguese, we are going to use por. So basically this is the logic of the, of the application. This is all the logic that we have. Uh, talking about the relationships between them, we have poll uh, that basically have the published date. Um, and if it's premium or not, um, related with the question that has the question itself, so it's text. And also we have the language that is a chart field saying if it's English or Portuguese. Um, and the question can have none or uh, uh, many choices. So a choice have a text saying like what's the option for the person to vote and also the number of uh, votes, so the total votes. Cool. Uh, here is the model. So this is the poll model. As I said already in the beginning, uh, in, in the last slide, we have the attributes. So basically, question, it's 101, publish date, author, and premium. And also we have a Dunder uh, method here, uh, Dunder string, that basically is responsible to do all this logic about showing the text of the question. Uh, of the poll. So gets the information from that question and puts a star, no star, and the uh, author or not author. Also we have a method here for the poll that is uh, for was published, basically to uh, handle the logic of the new label. And uh, we have questions with all the attributes and also some uh, auxiliary methods to say if it's in English, it's in Portuguese, and uh, also to get a string. For the choice, it's the simplest one, that's basically the, the attributes and the dunder string to get the, the value. Okay, so best practice, let's go. The first one is factories should represent their models. Actually, this is the most important one. If, a lot of times if you follow this one, the others will, will, will also work. So basically the idea is that the factory should represent exactly what you have in the database. So if you, are, you, if you have a relationship in a database, you, have, you should have in the, in, the, in the factory as well. If the value can be new in the database, so the factory also. So you have to map this the same way. So this way you can avoid implicit errors. So, um, and then you in the future and also your, your coworkers will know how this factory works because they already know how the model works. So they wouldn't need to guess how the factory works. So one example of how we shouldn't do this. The first one is, uh, so we have the poll factory here and the question factory. So we are saying here that uh, in the question factory, we are pointing to the poll. So, but if we see here in the model, we have the question, but there is no mention to poll at all here because the, the relationship is in the other way. So this, this is not good because in the model, we, are, we don't have the relationship, but in the factory we have. So the good way of doing this would be putting the, uh, the relationship in the proper place that is in the poll. So if you go back here and you see that poll does have the question uh, in the relationship. So here we map the same relationship. Second one is do not rely on the phones for factories. Basically, uh, this one means that if you have a value in the factory and the, uh, that you create by default and then you start using uh, in all the tests, relying that thinking that this value will be always the same, then this might uh, generate some problems. So for example, if someone goes and change the value in the factory, 
it will break your test that uh, it shouldn't. Also, um, we should like create a test having the most, uh, all the setup already there. So if anyone changes anything, doesn't matter because on your test you are setting everything that you want. So you are being explicit. You are being explicit what you want, saying exactly what is the value that you want. So let's see some example. Uh, we have poll, question, poll factory and question factory again, and then we have a test. The test is just to check if the text of the poll is, uh, is valid, is right. So here, a bad example would be to have a default value in the question factory and saying it explicitly as setting it explicitly as WhatsApp. And then in the test, in the test, you are asserting it directly. So you're getting this hard code value and checking if this is like a, a valid or not. So the idea here would be instead of first putting the value as hard coded, we could use faker. So uh, it would be always a new and uh, different value there. And also, uh, we should properly say explicitly what we want when creating a factory. So here, when we are creating a factory, we are saying that we want that premium is false, we want without uh, author, and we want with this text. So we are like, this is what I was trying to talk, uh, talk about, saying that we should be explicit in saying everything that you want inside the test. So we should do all the setup inside the test. Uh, the third one is factory should contain only the required data. This is, uh, this is also um, related to um, representing their model. So basically the rule is if, if the value in the database, uh, in, the, in, the, in the model says that could be null, so null equals true, then the attribute should be, um, if you are going to explicitly say that you want this attribute, you should put it under a trait. So then the user can have an option to use it or not, but by default, it will be new. It, it exactly the same way as it is in the database. So let's see an example of how not to do it. So we have here question, and then we have author. So if you go back here and we see question model, then there is, um, there, there is the author, uh, what is that, uh, is that question? Oh, it's Paul, that's why, okay. We have author, but then uh, it's no equals true. So it means that in the database we can have a, a poll without an author. And then here we are saying explicitly that every time that you create a factory, it will come already with an author, even though you didn't explicitly say that. So the idea would be to um, put it under a trade. So every time that you want an author, then you have to explicitly say that. So basically, if you want on author, you, you would use the factory in this way, poll factory with author equals true. So you're saying that you want an author. Otherwise, I think it's pretty hard to remember that we should also test the case where the author is known. Because this is like, we, we wouldn't probably remember about passing known as author. So in this way, you, you always remember to test all the cases. And, uh, and basically because we should not assume that we have an author in the, in the factory, since in the database we have the possibility of not having an author. So we are like missing one case here. Uh, the fourth one, it's build over create. This is super related with performance. Uh, basically, let's see the difference between them. Uh, when you do like myfactory.build, it creates an object in memory. But then we do myfactory.create, it creates in memory, but also stores in the database. So, Basically, uh, the idea here is not saying that you should never use create. It's just to keep in mind that first, if you're using create, you're not doing a unit test anymore. You are hitting the database. So you're really uh, testing more than just your unit. And uh, the second one, it will take more. So if you are okay with this, then, then it's all good. But I would say that especially for like huge uh, test suites, if you use more build, probably it will be way faster. So if you're using like in the bad way here, like bad way, uh, let's say that if you use a create, then you have to pass the notation. Okay, so you should not use create. <laughs> <laughs> so how would we do this? Uh, so basically we would use build instead and then all the magic would be done. Good. So just an example of how this can impact your performance 
We, we have a file with 14 tests, so really small file, 14 tests, and using only create, it was passing in 3.26 seconds. When we changed everything to start using build, it was less than two seconds. So imagine this for like more than 10,000 uh, tests. This can really impact. So the fifth one, this, this one uh, took me a while to understand, but once I understood the relationship between these, helped a lot to make the factories uh, not so tight. So this helped a lot. Basically the rule is, if there is a, a foreign key in the table, then you represent this relationship with a subfactory. If the foreign key is in the other table, then you use a related factor under a trait. So let's see. First, the difference between subfactory and related factory. Subfactory, when you are creating or building a subfactory, it creates at the same time of the main factory. So it, uh, it occurs at the same time. So if they are dependent, they will, uh, be, uh, they will be done at the same time. Uh, but in the related factory, it creates first the main factory and then the related factory. So mainly these are the difference. So seeing an example here of how we should do this, so we have the choices and uh, the question factory. So the first one, if you see here choice, um, here choice, we can see that we do have the foreign key. So if we do have the foreign key, see, this means that the, we really depend it's a, a dependence. So we should use a subfactory in this. So uh, we use a subfactory directly. If, uh, in the case of a question, if you go here, we see that we don't have uh, the, the relationship here uh, to the choice. So there is no mention of the choice. So the Ferengi key is in the other table. In this case, so what means is that we can have, for this model, we can have a question without a choice. So for that, we would create then a related factor because uh, the factor will be created afterwards and under the trade. So you can also create a factor with choice and without choice because in the database you can create without choice. So we should simulate the same for the factory. So basically this would be the way that we will create um, using the, the relationships. Um, the sixth uh, best practice is we can use fixtures because I was saying in the first uh, in the first slides that we uh, it should like factories being used instead of fixtures, but we can keep using fixtures like for simple objects, for example, like things that are not complex, but also to avoid uh, duplication. So this this best practice is a way of how to use fixture in a pretty good way. So basically, let's say that we have uh, this example here. We have two tests, and if you see, we are creating these two tests. Uh, two factories, uh, two objects from factories, but they are passing exactly the same attributes. So we are repeating ourselves a lot, and imagine if you have a lot of tests, this would be a lot of repetition. So one good way to do this is like uh, encapsulate this uh, using a fixture and then reuse this fixture in the test. So you have a pretty clear fixture that is in this case is like, I want a poll that is uh, English and it's no premium and there is an author and then you can reuse it. So this is a good way of using the fixture. But it's, uh, this leads us to our last best factor is that we should avoid sharing factors or our fixtures independently among different files. Why? So basically if we start sharing like having common fixtures, common factors in a file and have a lot of them, we start in creating dependencies a lot. So we, if we try to change, improve, or uh, if we try to do anything with this, uh, uh, with this, these factors or fixtures, it will touch in a lot of different places. So also, it tends to inflate because um, we have different scenarios where you are using the same fixture or the same factory, and then we are trying to accommodate. So we start putting things together, uh, things in the same fixture. And then it's get, it getting, getting bigger and bigger and bigger because you are trying to accommodate all the different scenarios where you shouldn't. So also it's hard to maintain, especially because if you change a factor of fixture, you have tons of tests and breaking at the same time. So you cannot uh, decoplate uh, everything. Um, 
and also one more time that if you start doing this, you probably will uh, be in a scenario where you are trying to make your test pass only to fit the fixture, to match the fixture, and not like really thinking about what your test should be doing. Okay, then, then we, like I started to notice the patterns, I, I saw all the best practices, I, I noticed, uh, I took note of everything, nice, so let's go and let's try to fix the first factory, right? So I got one of the main factories there, and then I saw like, yeah, why not? I will change it, I will do like use a related factory when it should, sub factory, nice. Cool, and then I broke more than <laughs> 1,500 tests. I really, it was painful. So what I say is, first of all, baby steps. So <laughs> if it's already too, too tight, if it's already in a really bad situation, probably you are going to have a lot of hard work, but let's, let's try it with the first thing. So the new ones, the new factors, try to use the best practice because this probably will help. And then trying to um, go factory by factory, changing step by step, because of course this could like be pretty hard, but I'm 100% sure that this can help a lot once you have the models and the factories matching, and then everything will happen as you would expect. Um, all these examples and the code of this app is in the GitHub repository, Camila Maya slash Factory Boys Best Practice. Uh, the official docs of Factory Boy is here. Also the common recipes, they have a page where they, they give some tips like this. So you can merge like some of these ones and uh, some of the Factory Boy uh, official ones. And also the code of the, the library itself is here. I would like to thank the whole organization because I know how hard it is to organize like a super huge event like this and it's been awesome. And I want to thank you everyone. And if you want to talk with me, I, these are my uh, social. And please let's keep in touch. If you have any doubts or any questions or any suggestions about Factory Boy, just talk with me. Thank you very much. Thank you.